Hello, I'm Patty Simpson with Simpson Math. In statistics, we collect data, but many times it's really important for us to be able to share that data. And in order for us to do that, it's nice to be able to make a visual that explains the data to my reader or to our reader so that they can just look and see different patterns within the data. So we're going to look at quantitative data where we've collected numbers, our values that we've collected, the data that we collect, we've collected looks like measurements or counts. So it's some sort of quantity. That's what makes it a quantitative data. We're gonna look at that quantitative data, how we can display it. And particularly, we are going to create frequency tables, which will put our numbers in categories and then count how many data, data values are in each of those categories, or we'll find the frequency of um, each category. This is gonna be a little more difficult than it was when we did qualitative data, because qualitative data is just automatically divided into categories. But when we have continuous data it, with our quantitative data, it makes it a little more difficult to divide it into different categories. We're gonna call those categories classes or bins. We're also gonna create a histogram. Histograms are also a frequency distribution that just show how many, are, how many data values are in each of our categories. Looks similar to the bar graph that we did with the qualitative data, but there are gonna be some differences between our histogram and our bar graph. We're gonna create a frequency polygon. A frequency polygon also is a frequency distribution that just shows how many are in each of the categories um, below. So this too is gonna to be a frequency polygon. We're gonna take all three of those and make them into relative frequency displays as well. Remember that to be a relative frequency display, we're just gonna show the frequency related to the whole. In addition to that, we're gonna create an ogive. An ogive shows cumulative frequency. So we're gonna add up our frequencies to each of our categories. We're gonna make a dot plot. We've made those before with qualitative data. We're gonna make the same dot plot plots here with quantitative data. Dot plots though can only be made with discrete quantitative data. We cannot make dot plots if we are looking at um, continuous data. And then last but not least, we're gonna create a stem and leaf plot. And stem and leaf plots are good for um, maintaining our data so that we can still see our pieces of data. Um, but they also show the frequency of data within each of the categories. So we'll make um, each one of these displays. Let's create frequency tables. Here we're gonna have quantitative data. Remember that quantitative data is just a quantity. We've collected some sort of measurement or count in order to um, have quantitative data. So it's not quite as easy to make a frequency table with quantitative data as it was with qualitative data. With qualitative data, we had set categories. It was easy to divide up the categories. But here, I don't know where my categories fall. For instance, in this data, every one of these, well, not all of them, but a lot of these look different. You know, there's not a set category. And if I use each one of the different numbers, I'm gonna have a lot of different categories. And it's just gonna have one data value in each one of those, or maybe two data values in each one. So we need another way to create some classes or bins or categories. So the first thing we're gonna do is determine the number of classes or bins that we want. How many categories do we want? And usually, depending on our data set, we're gonna have between five and 20 classes. Now, if we have a small data set, we're gonna probably have a small number of classes. If we have a large data set, then we're gonna have maybe more classes. We just want the classes to show our data. So, you know, just having five classes, it may be even all the way across and that doesn't show us anything about the data. And if, but if we have 20 different um, pieces, 
or categories. It may just show one in every category. That doesn't help us either. So we're trying to look for some sort of pattern within it. We need to make sure that our classes or categories, the number of those that we have, helps to determine or helps us to see those patterns. There are a couple of different ways to determine how many classes or bins or categories you need, but a lot of them involve upper level math, like maybe finding a logarithm. And we may not know yet how to find a logarithm, so I'm always going to give you the number of classes that you're going to need. Uh, the second step that we're going to do is we're going to determine the, an appropriate width for each of those classes. So, you know, am I going from 0 to 10? Am I going from 0 to 20? Am I going from 0 to 100? How wide is my class or my category going to be? And that kind of depends on my data and it depends on the number of classes I have. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through these steps where I find how spread out is my data. You know, if all my data is within one um, unit, then, uh, then my um, widths need to be really, really tiny. But if my data is way spread out, then my widths are going to be need to be wider. So the first thing I need to know is how spread out is my data. So I'm going to take my biggest number and my smallest number and subtract them to find out how spread out the data, the data is. Then I'm going to divide that by the number of classes I want. So if I have a hundred width, then, and I have only five classes, I know then that I've got to divide that up so that it's 20 in each class. But if it's one and I'm dividing it into five classes, well, then it's going to be, you know, two tenths for each of the widths. So I'm going to divide by the number of classes I have. And then the last thing I need to do is round up from that to make sure that I'm getting all my data values in there. So let me give you an example. Here I have some data where I have the prices of 3D TVs in dollars. And I want to find out the, how wide my bins need to be, how wide do my classes or categories need to be. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find, oh, let me first tell you that we're going to use five bins. So we're going to use five bins. And we're just going to take and we're going to um, find how spread out our data is first. So we're going to do our maximum number minus our minimum number. In our case, our maximum number appears to be this $19.99, $1,999. So I'm going to find the range, how spread out is my data. I'm going to take that $19.99 and I'm going to subtract my smallest number. And in this case, my smallest price is $1,594. So I'm going to find out how, how wide the range is my data. So just a little subtraction there, 5, 0, and 4. So it's 405 units wide. The price is range by $405. Then once I have my range, I'm going to divide it by the number of classes or bins that I'm going to have. So here I have the, to find the width, I'm going to take my range and divide it by the number of bins or classes. So I divide 405 by 5. 5 goes into 40 eight times. 5 goes into 5 one time. So my classes need to be at least 81. Oh, but wait a minute. I said we need to round it up. So they need to be at least 82 units wide in order for me to fit all the data values into them. So it's got to be at least, at least 82 units wide. So this finding the width just shows me that minimum number. But it doesn't mean that I have to count by that. And in fact, counting by 82s doesn't sound like a lot of fun. And I'm not sure that it will really represent my data very well. I am trying to display this data to make it easy for my readers. So if I look at my data and I think about what it might make sense to count by, 
I start thinking about, well, maybe it makes sense to count by tens or twenties or fifties, but all of those numbers are smaller than this. I have to be, count by at least 82s, but I don't want to count by 82s, but what about a hundred? A hundred's a nice, easy thing to count by, and yet it's, it's bigger than 82, but not too far off from it. So I'm going to count by 100s. So this is just the minimum width, the minimum width, but I'm going to make my width my width will be 100. I'm going to count by 100s. So I'm going to make five classes, and my classes are going to be 100 units wide. Let's do that. Let's create our five classes so that they are 100 units wide. Now I need to start at the smallest number. I need to at least start down at 1594. Maybe I want to start down at 1,500 to make sure that I'm counting them to make it easy to count by hundreds. Or maybe I want to count at 1,550, and then it'll also be an easy place for me to count by hundreds. So that starting place, I just need to make sure that when I'm done, that I've gotten all my data values in it. Let's try starting at 1500 and let's see if we can get all our data values in there. So I'm going to count from 1500 to 1600. Actually, I'm going to go 1500 and then in the next class, I'm going to start at 1600. And in the next class, I'm going to start at 1700. And then the next one is going to be 1800. And the next class is going to start at 1900. Now, those classes have ending points too. So if I'm starting at 1500, then I'm ending, well, I'm ending right below this 1600. So in this case, down one would be 1599. So this first class goes from 1500 to 1599, and I'm gonna include all the values in, the, in that price range. My next class are bin. I'm now gonna count by hundreds down that ending um, point, or we call that the class limit. So counting by hundreds from 1599 to 1699, 1799, 1899, and 1999. So if I look at each one of these, did I get all my data value in there? Well, the maximum number is 1999. He has a spot to be. He's in this class or that bin. My smallest number is 1594. He has a spot where he belongs. So all of my data is gonna fit in those five classes. I counted by a nice reasonable number that was at least 82 units wide. Now, in order to make a, a frequency table, once we have our classes or bin, it's not too bad. Now we are just going to count how many are in each one of those categories. So here, these are my prices. And on this side, I'm gonna put the frequency or the number of TV, TVs in each of those categories. And there's a couple of ways you can do this. You can go through and count and see how many TVs are in this price range between 1500 and 1599. So you know there's one, uh, two within that range. So maybe I, I do it that way. Or you could go through each one of them and write down a tally mark until you have them all there. Whichever is easiest for you. I'm just going to count how many are in each range. So there were two between the uh, 1500, within that 1500 to 1599 range. Between, or from 1600 to 1699, well, there's one, two, three, four, five, 
five values. Between 1700 and 1799, we have 1799, one, two, three, four data values. So on my frequencies, I'm gonna write a four. Then between 1800 and 1899, I have one, two, three, four, five data values in that range, in that category. And then from 1900 to 1999, I have one, two, three, four, within that range. Now to make sure that I got them all, or to make sure at least that I have the right number, I'm gonna add these up. So that's two plus five is seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. I have a total of 20 TDs that are represented on this frequency table. I also have a total of 20 prices here because there were four times five prices makes a total of 20 prices. So I have included everybody on my um, frequency distribution. Remember on all of our displays, we should have titles. I didn't leave enough room at the top for my title, so I'm gonna put my, my title on the bottom. But all of our displays should have titles. So this one is just the prices of 3D TVs. So when we make our frequency tables, the first thing we have to do is figure out our categories, our classes or bins. And we're gonna use that width and the range, the number of, um, we're gonna use our range and the number of classes to figure out our width. And then we're gonna use, think about what makes sense to count by and count by those. So there's our frequency table where we can see how many um, data points are within each one of those categories. Let's create a frequency table with quantitative data. So we have data here that was collected on the number of miles professors drive to work daily. And the data is shown here below. And we want to create a frequency display, a frequency table that shows the frequency in each of our categories. But the first thing we need to do is decide on how many categories we want and what those categories are going to be. Now, I'm going to provide the number of categories or classes or bins for you. And here I say to use six classes. There are lots of different techniques for finding the number of um, classes, but many of them um, involve some upper level math. So I'm just gonna tell you that we're gonna use six classes or bins. So then the next thing we have to do is figure out how wide our classes or bins are gonna be or what the minimum width is. So the way we do that is the first thing we do is find the range of our data. And the range of our data is just our maximum number minus our minimum number. So we look for the largest number in our data set and the largest number in our data set is 11.8. Then I'm going to look for my smallest number in my data set. And the smallest number in my data set looks to be one. So when I subtract those, I see that my range is 10.8 or 10 and 8 tenths. I'm going to take that range now, how spread out my data is, and I'm going to divide it into six equal groups. And I want to know how much is going to be in each group. How wide is each one of those groups going to be? So our width, and actually this is our minimum width. It's the smallest that we can make each of our classes or bins. We're going to take that 10 and 8 tenths, our range, and we're going to divide it by the number of classes or bins we're going to use. In this case, six. So six goes into 10 one time with four left over. Six goes into 48 eight times. So six goes into 10 and eight tenths, one and eight tenths time. This is the smallest that we can count by, the smallest that our, our classes 
are, can be wide. And actually, we need to round that up one spot. So we round that up to at least 1.9. We need to count by at least 1 and 9 tenths. Now, I don't want to count by 1 and 9 tenths. That just seems like an awkward number to count by. It might be easier just to count by twos. Twos are a nice, pretty number that's um, bigger than 1 and 9 tenths, and yet it's close to that, and it's a reasonable number to count by. So I'm going to make my width of my classes two. Then I just need to decide on what those classes will be. Well, I need to make sure that I count. I start at a spot where I can include my minimum number. So maybe my first one, I start at zero because between zero and two, one would fit in there. So I'm going to start my first class. So here I'm going to put my categories. These categories are the miles that the um, professors are driving. So my first category is at zero. I'm gonna count by twos now. Zero, two, four, six, one, two, three, four, five, six classes. Zero, two, four, six, eight, ten, and that gives me six categories. Now I need a stopping spot as well. That's my starting spot. My stopping spot needs to stop before two, and since I count by tenths here, I'm gonna go out to that tenths. So one and nine tenths would take me to that um, next number. I'm gonna do the same thing where I count by twos because I've decided my width is two. So I'm gonna count by twos. Well, one and nine tenths, count by twos, and I'm at three and nine tenths. This is five and nine tenths seven and nine tenths, nine and nine tenths, and 11 and nine tenths. So I've created my six categories, or my six classes, and I'm gonna make sure that my minimum and my maximum all fall in there. Well, my minimum number was one. It falls in the first bin. And my maximum number was 11.8. That falls in the last category. So every data point has a um, place. Every data point has a class or a bin that it belongs in. Now I'm just going to count the frequency of each. So in other words, how many data points are in, how many professors drive those many miles to work every day. So this part is the number of professors. So professors. So how many professors drive between zero and one and nine tenths miles to work every day? We go back and look at our data, find out, and it looks like there's only one um, professor that drives that distance to work each day. Then between two and um, three nights, so here's one, two, three, that's it. Three professors drive between two and um, four miles to work every day. Then between four and five nights, we just count how many data values there are. So there's one, two, three, four professors that drive that distance to work every day. Between six and seven nights, so one, two, three, four, um, professors drive that distance to work every day. Eight and nine tenths, between eight miles and nine tenths. It's one, two, uh, three professors that drive that distance. And then last but not least, this more than 10 miles there from 10 to 12 miles there is um, one, two, three professors that drive that distance each day. I'm going to kind of check myself just by making sure that I have enough data values. So there's 4 and 4 makes 8, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. I have 18 professors represented there. And let's see how many data values I had. Well, it was 3 times 6, so there's a total of 18 data values. 
So I at least have given every data value a home. With frequency um, tables, as well as with any other display, we need to make sure that we have a table, I mean a title. So for this one, my title is just something that lets my reader know at a glance what my data is. In this case, it's the miles, the miles professor's drive. Just some title to let your reader know what it is your data represents. So there's a frequency table of this quantitative data. Histograms are another type of display that we can use to show quantitative data. So histograms are frequency display, so that means that they're gonna show us how many are in each category or class or bin. So here are a few characteristics of our histograms. First of all, histograms display quantitative data. So when we have data where it's a measurement or a count, we've written down numbers, those quantitative data we could display on a histogram. Histograms are very similar to bar graphs. We made bar graphs earlier, but bar graphs show qualitative data, whereas histograms show quantitative data. And because of that, there's a few similarities between the two, but there are also some differences. So for instance, with our bar graphs, we had nice, concise categories. We knew because it was qualitative data, it was categorical data, what our individual categories were. And notice that because they're very specific, there are spaces between my bars. Whereas with qualitative data, they're numbers, and numbers just go on and on forever and ever, and they meet with one another. We have to decide on a beginning point and an ending point. And in fact, with some of our quantitative data, it's continuous. We can get closer and closer or more and more precise. So we use a number line when we have our horizontal axis on a histogram. It's going to be a number line because our variables there are being um, measured with numbers. And so it's continuous. And so we're going to count by a continuous value. And so notice because of that, our bars end up touching one another. So in a bar graph, those bars are separate, but in a histogram, they're touching. But there are some similarities as well. For instance, we saw with bar graphs that we want to make our bars the same width every time. That's going to be true with our histograms as well. We're going to make our bars the same width every time. And in fact, once we decide on what we're counting by, we need to continue to count by that number from that point forward. With our bar graphs, we saw that we should always start at zero on our vertical axis to count our frequencies. That's gonna be true with our histograms as well. We need to start at zero for that vertical axis when we're counting the frequency in each category. A few other things that are similar. The bar graph, we saw we needed labels on each side. We're gonna need labels on our histograms as well. And we also always need a title on our um, displays and we're gonna need a title on our um, histogram as well. So, um, so this is kind of an idea of the histogram versus our bar graph. So you can see that the bars touch on the histogram, they don't touch on the bar graph. Both of them though show the frequency in each of our categories. In our histogram, another difference is that we lose the data. Here's what I mean by that. If you look at our bar graph, we know that the data that was written down, the word red was written down six times. I could reproduce the data that was given to me. I would just write down red six times. I would write down blue two times. I would write down green four times and I would write down purple one time and I would have my data set again. But with my histogram, it's not as obvious. I know that there are five numbers between five and 10, 
but I don't know what those numbers are. Maybe all five of them are the number seven. Or maybe all five of them are the number nine. Or maybe I have some numbers like six, seven, eight, nine, nine. Or maybe there are even decimals within there. It's 5.1, 5.2, 7.3. I don't know what the data values are. I just know that there are five that fall between this range. So in my histogram, I lose those individual data values the minute I create that histogram. So I'm just looking for then different patterns within those categories. Like I can tell that there are more between 15 and 20 than there are between 20 and 25. So it's a good way to display the data, but you do lose your individual data values in the histogram. In both of them, it's easy to spot which category has the most and which category has the least. Um, our histograms always show quantitative data, whereas our bar graphs show qualitative data. We're going to practice making a few histograms. Let's make a few histograms. Here I have two different data sets. The first one is the prices of 3D TVs, and the second one is the professor's commute, or the miles that a professor drives to work. We created these frequency tables earlier. So uh, we took our data and we created them into frequency distributions. So we know that in this case, I have one, two, three, four, five classes or bins. And in the first bin, there are two TVs within that price range. There are five within this price range, et cetera, et cetera. And we saw that the width of each fire bin was 100 because we went from 1500 to 1600 to 1700. Remember that in order to find that width, we first found the range of our highest data value minus our lowest data value, and we divided by the number of classes or bins we were going to have. Again, you can look at that um, in the same place where we did our frequency tables. So we're going to take this data and now create a histogram. Remember that a histogram is used for quantitative data like dollars. So with the histogram, what we do first is we draw a vertical axis, and this is going to represent our frequencies. And then I'm going to draw a horizontal axis, and the horizontal axis shows my categories. We already have our categories divided up for us. The first bin is going to be from 1500 to 1599. So along this horizontal axis, it's just a number line, and I'm going to treat it as such. I'm going to start at that lowest class value, that lowest limit there, so that I'm at 1500 is my starting spot. Then I need to make sure that I count by a consistent amount. Whatever I've decided to count by, that's what I need to count by my whole time. So if I count by 1500s or by 100, I need to make sure that I count by that the whole way. And since my class width was 100, it makes sense to count by hundreds. So from 1500 to 1600, same width, 1700, same width, 1800, same width, 1900, and last but not least, 2000. Now, I'm going to put my frequency. Remember, we always start our frequencies at zero. I only need to make it to five so I can count just by ones. One, two, three, four, five. If I had a larger um, data set, I might have to count by a larger number, but I would still need to start at zero. I need labels so that my reader knows exactly what it is that we are um, presenting. In this case, these are prices, maybe you even say in dollars. And then that, on this side, this is the frequency, or you could say the number of TVs. So those are our frequencies. Now I'm just going to draw bars to represent each one of those um, uh, frequencies. So this first 
bar needs to be too tall. Remember what this bar represents. That bar that is too high shows that there are two data values that are between 1500 and 1600. I don't remember what they are. Maybe they're 1594. Maybe they're 1599. Maybe they're 1500. I just know that they fit somewhere between those two numbers. And there are two data values that are within there. Then there are five within 16. 100 to 1699. So I make that bar go up to five. There are four in the next class or bin. There are five in the next one. And in the last bin, they're back down to four again. Notice how my bars touch each time because we're on that number line. Now, there are a few confusing things here about the histogram. For instance, this 1600. What if I have a TV that is 1600? If the price of it was 1600, where exactly does it fall? Does it fall in this bin here? Or does it fall in that bin there? What about 1700? Which one does it fall in? Typically, we just kind of have a rule that the data value would fall to the right. So in other words, if I had a TV that was 1600, it would fall in the bin to the right. But if I wanted to make this a little more precise for my reader, I wanted to make sure that my reader knew where that 1600 fell, I could make these values in here, make it obvious where it falls. I could use the midpoint between here and there to show where each one of them falls. Here's what I mean. The midpoint is right in the middle, right in the middle between 1599 and 1600, between my upper bound and my lower bound, between that maximum of this class and the minimum of that class. So what's right between 1599 and 1600? Well, it's 1599 and a half. Or I could write that like this, 1599.5. Now, if that's the value, I now know that if I have a TV that is 1599, that it would fall into this category. If I had a TV that was 1600, it would fall into that category. Maybe if I had TVs that had cents to them too, like change as well, I might need to even go out further to help me differentiate. But if I decide to make that one 1599.5, I need to make sure I'm counting by a consistent number. So if I changed that to the midpoint, I would have to change this to the midpoint as well to be 1699.5. Notice I've just counted by 100. Then I would make this one into the midpoint. It would be the midpoint between 1799 and 1800, which would be 1799 and a half. And I just keep counting by hundreds. So 1899 and a half and 1999 and a half. And it just makes it more obvious to my reader where that whole number of 1600, where it would fall. Now, I'd also have to change this one, go back 100, so that I'm at 1499.5. So I've counted by a consistent amount all the way. So this just gives it a little more precision. We could have left it the way it was. Maybe that's prettier. And if you're trying to display it in some sort of publication where you want it to look pretty, then maybe you leave it at 1500, 1600, 1700. But then you kind of have to decide which side does that 1600 go on. This just gives it a little more precision so I know exactly where my data falls. And the way we did this was we found the midpoint. Let me just teach you a minute about where the midpoint is. We just kind of saw where it was in the middle. We said between 1599 and 1600 is at a halfway place. But if I wanted to show you that mathematically, what I could do is just take those two numbers and add them together and divide by two. 
and that would give me the midpoint. So to find the midpoint of two numbers, you can just add them together and divide by two. Watch, if I do that, I'm gonna still end up with that same 15.99 and a half. So in this case, I end up with nine and nine, 11 carrier one to 31.99. I'm gonna divide that by two. Well, two goes into three one time with one left over. Two goes into 11 five times with one left over. Two goes into 19 nine times with one left over. Two goes into 19 nine times with one left over, but I need a decimal here. Two goes into 10 five times. Notice I ended up with that 1599.5. So to find the midpoint, you can just add two numbers together and divide by two. So here's my histogram. The only thing that it's lacking is a title. All of my displays should have a title to let the reader know at a glance exactly what data they're looking at. So here's my 3D TV prices. And there's our, our histogram. Now we've lost our data within here, just as we lost our data when we created the, the frequency table but we can begin to look and see where most of our TV prices lie. Let's create a histogram for the professor's commute. In this case, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna make a, a vertical axis and a horizontal axis. Give myself a little room down here. I only need to be able to count to four. So I start at zero and I'm counting up. I will count by ones since I'm only going to four. If I were counting to a larger number, I might count by a different thing. I don't want to count by too big though. I want to keep it as small as I possibly can. But the big deal is I must always start at zero. On the uh, vertical axis there, I have my frequencies. In this case, my frequencies are the number of professors. Then um, my categories or my classes or bins are the number of miles. So I'm gonna start at that smallest one. This one happens to be zero. On my vertical axis, I always need to start at zero. On my horizontal axis, I can start it at whatever my minimum number is. So here I'm gonna count by those twos. So zero, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, to make sure I get them all in. If I wanted to make it more precise, I would do that same thing, where I, I look at the midpoint between 1.9 and two, well, halfway between 1.9 and two would be 1.95. So I could change this to 1.95 to make it more precise make it better for my reader to know right where the two is falling. Or this way works as well. I'm gonna now um, make my bars for each category. So this was too high. The next one goes up to three. The next one is three again, then four, then three, then three. Now along here, I need my label of miles. And then I need my title of the professor's commute or the um, number of miles a professor drives. And there I have my histogram that shows the frequency of each one. It's pretty much uniform or it's pretty well spread out that they, about, they go about the, each category has about the same uh, number of professors in it. And remember again what this bar means. This bar means I have two values between zero and two. They might both be one, they might be 0.1, they might be 1.1. I don't know what they are, I just know there are two values between zero and two. In this bar, I have four values between six and eight. Again, I don't know exactly what those data points were, but I know it's something between six and eight, like maybe 6.1, 6.6, 6, 
seven and 7.2. I don't know, just something in that range. And there are four values there. So these both are histograms and those histograms are just frequency distributions. A frequency polygon is just another way to display quantitative data. So a po frequency polygon shows the frequency or the number of data values in a category or a class or bin. So we've made a frequency um, display before. This is a histogram that we've created before with our professor's commute or the number of miles the professor drives to school. I'm gonna use this same data to help me create a frequency polygon. Now a frequency polygon just takes the midpoint that middle value of our histogram. And instead of drawing the bars, we're gonna, at the midpoint, put, put a point there. So this is between, right in the middle of this zero and two. Remember to find that midpoint, we can add the two numbers up and divide by two to find our midpoint. Or we can just look and see that right in the middle between zero and two would be one. So there's gonna be a point on our frequency polygon at one, two. And I'll create the frequency polygon in a minute on that side. I just wanna show you how it relates to our histogram. Then in the middle of this bar, right in the middle of our histogram here, there were three professors that drove between two and four miles to work every day. Well, I'm gonna show that same thing by putting a dot right in the middle of that class. So in the middle of two and four would be three. Again, I'm gonna do the same thing where I look right in the middle, so at five, and I'm gonna put a dot right in the middle of that or point there right in the middle of this bar between six and eight, in between eight and 10, and then again in between 10 and 12. Now we just take our midpoints there from each class and connect the dots. Then there's one last thing with our polygon. We're gonna take and show that in the class before this, that there were no data values, no one drove less than zero miles to work. So to show that, I'm gonna go back one more of these distances, and I have to figure out what that point would be. Well, notice I'm counting by twos. One, three, five, well, if I go backwards, five, three, one. If I go back two, I'm actually at a negative one. Then I'm going to go forward another value there, another width there, to come back down to show at the end there were zero in that category above 12 miles. So from 12 to 14, there was no one, and that midpoint is 13. So my, po my frequency polygon just uses the midpoint of my class and then the frequency of the number in that class. So if I were actually creating a frequency polygon using this data, I would do first a vertical axis that shows the frequencies. And then I would have a horizontal axis to show the classes or bins, my categories. Here I only need to count to four because the highest frequency I have is four. Just like with our frequency table, uh, I mean, just like with our bar graph and our histogram, we need to make sure that our vertical axis starts at zero every time. Then we can count by a consistent amount. I can count by ones here, and that is still the number of professors. So I still need labels, just like I do on my histogram, my bar graphs. Then here, I'm gonna count across. I'm gonna start at that lowest value of negative one. This represents the class that was before zero. And there were zero in, there were no data points that were below zero. 
then I'm counting over. The midpoint of my first class is one. And there are two data values that are in that class. So this one represents from zero to two. This two shows that there are two data values between zero and two. I'm gonna keep counting by that consistent amount. Three is the next um, midpoint in my next class. So again, this class goes from two to four and there were two data values in that class. Then in the next one, five is the midpoint and there were, uh, oops, this was supposed to be three. I'm sorry, they were both supposed to be three because there were three in those. No, this was two, that one's three. Then in the next class is also three. In seven, we go up to the four, and this represents, again, that, that class of six to eight. Then out to nine, there were three data values in that class. 11. There are three data values in that class. And then we move past it, past that last class, 13, and there weren't any in there. There were none that were that big or none that were in the class of 12 to 14. So that our frequency polygon looks like this. Now, this represents one, two, three, four, five, six classes. Notice we're not counting our endpoints. They weren't classes in our original data. So our original data just had one, two, three, four, five, six classes. You don't count those endpoints. It just kind of brings it down um, firmly. Then I need labels. This is the number of miles. I need a title. So professors commute. And again, what this tells me is, is I look at this and I say, okay, well, how many professors went between um, six and eight miles? Well, between six and eight miles would be this class. And there were four professors then that went that distance. This is a frequency polygon. Frequency polygons display quantitative data we're gonna create a frequency polygon of this quantitative data. So we have data showing the starting salaries for entry level accountants at public accounting firms. We have a few salaries here, and we're gonna create a frequency polygon to display or show this data in a little bit more readable fashion. So the first thing we need to do is we need to come up with our categories, our classes or bins. So to do that, we have to decide how wide each of our classes are. This is quite a bit of data. So we're going to make eight classes for this particular one. There are lots of different ways to decide on the number of classes or bins. Um, several of them require upper level mathematics. So I'm just going to tell you, we're going to use eight bins or eight classes. So now we need to decide how wide to make each one of those classes. And the way that we find that width, the first thing we need to do is find the range. So we're going to find that range. And the range is just your maximum minus your minimum, your biggest number minus your smallest number. So if we look at our data, our largest data value is 51,500. So I'm gonna take that 51,500 and I'm gonna subtract my smallest number. Here, my smallest number is 40,900. That's the smallest salary there. I'm just gonna do a little subtraction there. And here I've got zero, zero, that's a six. I had to borrow, so that's 50. So I've got uh, 10,600. Now, to find the width, I'm gonna take that range, how spread out my data is, and I'm gonna divide it by how many classes I'm gonna put that in. So I wanna divide this range by that eight, and that's gonna give me my minimum width. 
that's going to be the minimum width of each of my bins. So I take my range, which is 10,600, and I divide it by 8 to find out that minimum width. Well, 8 goes into 10 one time with 2 left over. 8 goes into 24 or 26 three times with 2 left over. 8 goes into 20 two times with 4 left over. And 8 goes into 45 times. So the minimum width of my um, of each of my classes or bins is going to be 1,325. But I don't want to count by 1,325. So that sounds like a difficult thing to count by, and I'm not sure how meaningful that would be for my data. So instead, what I'm going to do is pick a number that to count by that's close to this, and yet it makes is a little more reasonable for counting by. For instance, maybe I count by 1500s. So I'm going to make my class width 1500 each. So the class width, I'm going to make 1500. So now I'm going to make a frequency table to display this data. And then I'm going to create my frequency polygon from that frequency table. So I'm just going to, for my frequency table, I'm going to pick my starting spot. It needs to be around 40,900 in order for me to get to my 1500. Uh, I mean, and then use that 1500, count by those 1500s. So I'm going to start at just 40,000 so that I can include that 40,900. And now I'm going to count by 1500 each time. So from 40,000, my next starting point is going to be, or my class limit there is going to be at 41,500. I'm just going to continue to add that 1500 until I have eight um, beginning points of my classes or eight um, class limits for my uh, classes. So this is 43,000. Um, add 1500 again, and I've got 44, 500. Add 1500 again, and I'm at 56,000. Add 1500 again, and I'm at 57,500. Add 1500 again, and I'm at 5,900. Add 1500 again, and I'm at 50,150. Um, I mean, that's not right, 500, sorry. And then one last time, let's see, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. No, that's enough. I've got my eight classes there. Now, I'm going to show where that class ends. Where's the ending point on each of these categories? So if this one starts at 41,5, that means the ending point is going to be at 41,499. Just one, one dollar below that. And I'm going to do the same thing again where I'm adding 1,500 because it's 1,500 wide to each one of those to get those um, ending class limits there. So that I'm at um, right before this one, so 42,999. But also if you add 1,500, you should get that same thing. Then I'm gonna add 1,500 again to get to 44,999. I'm gonna add 1,500 again to get to 45,000 Oops, this is 499, sorry. Then this is 999. Add 1500 and we're at 46, I mean 47, 499. It's $1 before this, or if you add 1500. Add 1500 and we're at 48,999. Add 1500 and we're at 50,499. And add 1500 again, and we're at 51,999. Um, now we want to make sure that our classes includes all of our data. Does everybody have a place that they belong? Where our smallest number was at 40,900, and our biggest number was at 41,500. So yes, every data point has a place to be. Now I'm going to make my frequency table. So these are the salaries. And over here, I'm going to tell how many people the number of accountants 
goes into that category. I'm going to put my frequency. How many are in each category? So now I have recorded how many are in each category. How many accountants have a salary in each one of those classes or bins? So we have our frequency table. I'm going to use this frequency table to make a frequency polygon. So for a frequency polygon, the first thing we need is a vertical axis. This vertical axis, axis is going to show the frequencies. Just as this has in some of our other frequency distributions, we need to make sure that our frequencies always start at zero. Regardless of what we're counting by, whether it's ones or tens or ten thousands, our frequencies should always start at zero. Then, in this case, I only need to count by ones because the highest number I need to get to is six. So I'm just going to count by ones up to six. Two, three, four, five, six. You always pick a consistent number to count by and count by that all the way up and make sure your distances are the same distance all the way through. Then, on my horizontal axis, I am going to put my categories. So my categories here, or my classes, or bins, are represented here. On the frequency um, polygon, we use the midpoint to represent those classes. So I'm going to put the midpoint of this 40,000 to 41,499, or this midpoint actually between 40,000 and 41,500. I'm going to find the midpoint between those two numbers. Remember to find the midpoint, we just add the two numbers together. So this number, the starting point and that ending point, I'm going to add those two numbers together and divide by two. And that's going to tell me what's right in the middle of these two. So here I have 81,500. I'm going to divide that by 2. I added them together. I'm dividing that by 2. 2 goes into 8 four times. 2 goes into 1, well, 0 times with 1 left over. 2 goes into 15 seven times. That's 14 with 1 left over. 2 goes into 10 five times. And 2 goes into 0, 0 times. So my midpoint there is 40,750. That's the midpoint of this um, first class or bin. So I'm going to put a little mark here for that first class or bin, and I'm going to put that label of 40,750. Then at that midpoint, I need to go up to the frequency of 2. So this midpoint and that 2, this says that within that class, that bin, there are two accountants that make that salary within that, that bin. Then from there, I can use that same 1,500 that we counted by here to count by on my, um, on my categories here for my classes or for my bins because counting by 1,500 will be the midpoint of the next one also. So if I add 1,500 to this, then I'm going to get um, 42,250, uh, I'm sorry, 250. So that is the midpoint between 41,500 and 43,000. We could add those two together and divide by two, or we can just add that 1,500 on here. I'm going to continue to count by that 1,500 all the way up to get those midpoints. So here I have 43,750. I should be keeping that same distance because this is 1,500 apart. That's 1,500 apart. This next one's going to be 1,500 apart. So I add 1,500 and I have 45,250. Um, add another um, 1,500 and I'm at 46,750. Add another 1,500 and I'm at 48,250. Add another um, 1,500 and I'm at 49,750. Um, I'm gonna run out of room. And then add another one, and I'm at 51, 51, um, 250. And one more at the very edge of the board. And that very last one is, oh wait, this is it. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight classes. Those are the midpoints of each of those. So this 40,750 is the midpoint here. 
the 4250 uh, is the midpoint there, et cetera, et cetera. So now I'm gonna put my frequencies on each, though, each of those. So this class we already have. This class has three. So at that midpoint, I'm gonna put a point at three. This class at four. This class at five. So at the midpoint and the frequency. 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 And at the midpoint and the frequency. Now I just connect those dots. Then there's one last piece of the frequency polygon. With my frequency polygon, then I'm gonna end it up at zero and begin it at zero. So I have to go back one more class. I'm gonna go back one more 1500. So if I go back 1500, I'm now at 39,250. And there weren't any salaries below that 40,000. So to show that, I'm gonna put a dot there at zero. And then I'm gonna also go forward one. So, you know, the next class then, if I count by 1500, I'm now at 52,750, 52,750. And there weren't any salaries that high either, so I end up here. But really, this represents eight different classes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Mine needs a little work because the distance here looks longer than the distance there. So mine's kind of distorted. I would need to go back and fix it a little better. Here, you need a label. So we have frequencies. This is the number of accountants. And then down here, these are my salaries in dollars. And then all good displays have a title. So this is the salaries. of newbies, newbies accountants, uh, newbie accountants. There we go, so there's my title. So that is a frequency polygon. Let's talk about ogives. Ogives are cumulative frequency polygons or cumulative frequency displays. They show the data cumulatively. Now, what does that mean? Well, think about your final exam. When your teacher says that you have a cumulative um, final exam, it means that it includes everything from the entire semester. So that's what it means to be cumulative. So for instance, here we have a, a frequency table that shows some data of professors' commutes, and it shows us the number of miles that they commute, and then the number of professors that drive that many miles. So for instance, if I ask you how many professors drive less than two miles, well, below two miles, there's one professor that drove, drives less than two miles. But if I asked you how many drive less than four miles, you would say four and one. So, I mean, three and one, which makes a total of four that drive less than four miles. If I ask you how many drive less than 12 miles, you would show all of them. That would be cumulative. You're adding up everything that's happened before. So I'm gonna make a polygon, I mean an ogive that shows all those cumulative frequencies. In order to do that, I first am going to need a vertical axis to show my frequencies. And just as we have in our other displays, when we have a vertical axis to show frequencies, that needs to start at zero. I need to know what is the highest number I'm gonna to need to get to. Well, it's gonna be cumulative. So at the end, I'm gonna to get to the total of however many data values I have. And here I have one plus three is four, and four is eight, plus four is 12, plus three is 15, plus three is 18. There are a total of 18 data values here. I need my frequency to go up to that total of 18. So I'm gonna draw it a little bit straighter and I wanna make sure I'm counting by something to get to 18. It's not a very big area that I'm dealing with, so maybe I count by, let's just see how many little spots I get in there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it looks like I can count by twos to make it to 18. Starting at zero, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. We count by that consistent amount all the way and make sure that our distances are all the same. Those are our frequencies. Then along the horizontal axis, we have our classes or our bins. In this case though, we're going to start at actually our second class, this bottom number of our second class at that two. And I'm gonna put a mark there for that class. So we know that below that, less than two, there was one professor that went less than two miles. So I'm gonna put a, a, a dot at this class and the one. So below that, there's one professor. Then I'm gonna move up to my next class. It looks like I'm counting by twos. My widths are two wide. So then there are below the four, there's three plus one makes four. Next class is at six. So below that six is seven, eight. So I'm gonna go up to eight. Then my next one's gonna be at eight and below eight is eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So I've now made it up to 12 people below that eight. Then 10, and at 10, below 10, well I was at 12, I'm gonna add three, so I'm at 15. And then the next one, I'm counting by twos each time, so the next one's gonna be at 12. And the ones that are below the 12 miles, well I was at 15, add three, and I'm at 18. And in a cumulative um, frequency uh, display, you should end up with however many data values you started with. Then I just connect those dots, and there is my ogive. Now, the ogives are really good at showing increases along the way. So here, when it's really steep, it tells me that it had a lot of increase. When it's less steep, it tells me that there was less increase in that category. So here in this steep one, it should be less than um, in the, uh, the flatter areas. All frequency, all tables, all displays need to have labels. So here it's the number of professors. And down here is the miles that they drive. And then of course, our um, title to let our reader know exactly what it is that we are doing. Let's make one more ogive. So we've kind of got the idea now. We make a vertical axis for frequencies and a horizontal for our classes or bins. And then we need to know how high we're going to count. So we just add them up 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 16, 20. So I need to make sure I make it up to 20. Maybe again, I count by twos, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, and 20. And my spacing there is not the best. We should be nice and evenly spaced. Eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. And then I'm gonna do the same along here where I go to my second class, that beginning point. 1600 and there are two below that then my next one is at at 1700 and below 1700 there are seven and the next spot is 1800 just counting by hundreds and below 1800 there's 9 10 11 add to that 11 then at 1900, add five to the 11, and I'm at 16. And then I have to do one more. So I'm counting by hundreds, 18, 19, I'm at 2000. And below 2000 are all of them. So that should be at 20. I just connect the dots for that ogive. 
and it shows me that it's pretty consistent all the way, which five and four is pretty consistent in my steepness. So when I have one that's really steep, it tells me that it's more, um, more increased than when it's flatter than that. So an ogive just shows the cumulative frequency. Of course, we need um, the titles on each. So this is number of TVs. And of course, this is the price of 3D TVs. So that's how we make an ogive. Relative frequency displays just show the frequency of data related to the total number. So we asked the question earlier, is 100 a big number? And it all depends on what it's relative to. You know, are we talking about someone who's got no money at all? Then $100 is a, is a huge amount. But if I'm talking about a billion dollar budget, $100 is nothing. So it's all relative to what the total is. So our relative frequency displays show frequencies relative to the total number of data values. And we show that using fractions, percents, or decimals. So let's look at a few frequency distri distributions and let's turn those into relative frequency distributions. So all we do to turn them into relative frequency displays is we just first look at the total number. So I'm just gonna add these numbers up first. So one plus three is four, plus four is eight, plus four is 12, plus three is 15, plus three is 18. So this has a total of 18 data values. And I want to know what is one out of that total. So I'm literally just going to make a fraction. It's one out of my total of 18. So now I've turned it from a frequency to a relative frequency. I'm going to do the same thing with three. It's three out of 18. But three out of 18 can be reduced to one sixth. So I'm going to write it in its reduced form or simplified form. Then four, I'm going to put that four over 18 over the total number. And then I'm going to re reduce that fraction to two ninths. And then this same four will also be two ninths. And my three will also be one sixth because it'll be three eighteenths. And this three will also be one sixth. So to turn it into a relative uh, frequency display or table, I just add it up and then put my frequencies over the total number. So the only other thing I need to change on this to make it a relative frequency uh, table is instead of the number of uh, professors, this needs to say the fraction of professors. I no longer know for sure how many um, total professors we interviewed, but I know the fraction of the professors we interviewed that one out of every 18 that we interviewed drove be be between zero and 1.9 miles. I'm going to do the same thing with my 3D prices. I just need the total number in this histogram in order for me to be able to turn the frequencies into relative frequency. So the first thing I have to do is figure out my total number. Well, remember that this bar represents two data values between those numbers. So there's two data values here, plus another five data values there. So there's two here, plus five there, plus four in this one, plus five in this one, plus four in that one. For a total of seven, and four makes 11, 16, 20. There's a total of 20 data values represented by this histogram. 17 different TVs were recorded. So that, um, I'm sorry, 20 different TVs. How many was it? 20, uh, nine and nine is 18, 19, 20. 20 different TVs recorded there. So I'm gonna take each one of these and put it over 20 to turn it into a relative frequency display or histogram, relative frequency histogram. Now I'm gonna write each one of these as a percent. Over there we wrote it as fractions. I could reduce this and put it as a fraction that way, or I could write it as a percent. 
So here I have 1 out of 20. Multiply the top and the bottom by 5, and 1 20th is the same as 5 out of 100, which equals 5%. 2 out of 20, multiply the top and bottom by 5, and you get 10 out of 100, which is 10%. 3 out of 20, well notice I'm now counting by 5s, 5, 10, I bet this is 15, but let's just check it. 20 times 5 gives me 100, and 3 times 5 gives me 15, sure enough 3 20ths is the same as 15%. So now I'm just going to count by those 5%, 20%, 25%. So I've turned that into a relative frequency histogram. I just took my um, frequencies and divided by the total number that there were. Now, I don't know for sure anymore. The minute I do that, I don't know for sure how many TVs, but I do know that however many TVs there were, that 10% of them fell in this range. This is no longer the number of TVs, it's now the percent of TVs. Last but not least, I have my um, frequency polygon. This frequency polygon is missing its title. All um, displays should have titles, and then we should have the um, here's labels in each of those places. So whoever made this frequency polygon um, didn't add those things in there. So here we have the frequency or the number of accountants. Same number of people there. And then all I'm going to do to make it a relative frequency display is first I have to find the total number. Well, remember that this first dot here represents two people that were in this salary range. So there were two people in this salary range. There were three people in that class or bin. There were four in this one. There were five with salaries in that range. There were six in this range, six in that range, two in that range, and two in that range. So to find the total number, I need to add all those numbers. So two plus three is five, that's nine, that's 14, 20, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. I'm just going to take each one of these and put it over 30. So that's 1 30th. 2 30th is the same as 1 15th. 3 30th is the same as 1 10th. 4 30th is the same as 2 15th. 5 30th is the same as 1 6th. And 6 30th is the same as 1 5th. It is no longer a, a, a number, it's now the fraction. So the frequency over the total number. I can do that with each of these, say it's the frequency over the total number. Well, in this case, the percent. So that's always out of 100. Okay, so a relative frequency display, to make it into a relative frequency display, we just take our frequencies and put it over the total number of data values that we have. There is some loss of data the minute we make it into a relative frequency um, distribution. We no longer know how many TVs were recorded. We no longer know how many professors commuted, and we no longer know how many um, of these salaries were collected. But we do know that however many were collected, one fifteenth of them fell in that range. Let's create a stem and leaf plot. A stem and leaf plot is a display of data that maintains the data values. After we've created our display, we will still be able to see our data values. And it does a good job of showing the differences in each class or category of our data. A stem and leaf plot always shows quantitative data. So, here we have a stem and leaf plot, and a stem and leaf plot is going to always have in the leaf's position the last important digit of the data set. And then the other values will be the first, those will be your stem. Whatever's left over will be the stem. 
Let me start by just creating one for you with these ACT scores. So in this case, the last important digit of our data values is in the ones place. This ones place, the numbers in the one place are going to be our leaves. Then the remaining beginning numbers, the tens place, will be our stem. So I'm going to start by looking at the stems of each of those. And the stems are really our categories, our classes, or our bins. So in this case, we're going to have tens, we're going to have twenties, and we're going to have 30s that are our categories or our classes. The 3 is the highest number and the 1 is the smallest. So I'm going to have three different categories here, 1, 2, and 3. Then the 1's place will be my leaves. So for instance, this 8, this 18 will be written as 1, 8. That represents the number 18, that data value. This 23, I put a 3 there with a 20, so that I have 23. To put 24, it's also in this category. So it's 24 goes in that category as well. 31 is in our 30s category, and 19 is here in the teens category. I'm going to do that for each one of my data values. So that this is 23, 24, 27, 26, 22, 32, 18, 35, 27, 29, 24, 20, 18, 17, 21, 25, and 26. So we can clearly see that there are more values in our 20s than there are in any other category. Now, as we make a stem and leaf plot, I've, done a, I've made a few mistakes. There are some things I need to fix. Because one thing we do with our leaves is we always put them in order from least to greatest. So in this case, I have a 7, 3 eighths, and a 9. I should write it so that my 7 is first. And then I have those three eights and then a nine. It shows the same data, but it now has them in the correct order. So that I have 17, 18, 18, 18, and 19. I'm going to do the same thing with my 20s here so that I put them in the correct order. So I have a zero, a one, one, two, one, three, two, fours. Let me just start there. Zero. One, one, two, one, three, two, fours, one, five, there were two sixes, two sevens, and a nine. So that they're all in the correct order and then this one already is in the nice least to greatest order so there's my data now another thing to notice is that notice that the columns line up with one another they should be equally spaced and those columns should line up with one another so that we know that at this point these two are the same they have the same values you know there are three data values up to that point if you turn your head sideways, you can kind of look at it as a histogram. You know, if I had drawn my bars around it like this, it's like I have a histogram that's showing those frequencies of how many are in each one. So, but the difference between this and a histogram is that we actually maintain our data values. So, um, we, and we can clearly see that there are more in the 20s than the other two. I'm going to do the same thing with my starting salaries. I'm going to create a stem and leaf plot. So with the stem and leaf plot, I'm going to look for my last important value. And my last important number here is actually, notice that all of my data values have zeros. So my last important value is actually in the hundreds place. So those are going to be my le leaves. 
Then my stems on these salaries are going to be the, um, the ten thousands and the thousands place. So I'm going to look for the smallest of these um, stems, and my smallest stem is going to be in the 40s. So that's my smallest stem. Let me write stem up there. And my smallest stem is going to be at 40. And now my largest stem, if I look, my largest stem is at 51. So I'm going to count my stems down all the way to 51. So I've got 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, and 51. Now my leaves are going to be those hundreds places. So I'm just going to add my leaves. I'm going to go through my data values and I'm going to add the leaves to it. So um, let's see if I can do it in order this time. I have 40,700 and then 40,900. So this seven on here means 40,700. And then I'm going to put the nine, there's 40,900. There aren't any that are 41,000, so I'm just going to leave this blank. If there aren't any in that category, we just leave it so that there are no data values there. Then at 42, I have three different um, data values that are at 42. There's 42,500, there's 42. Um, 700 and then there's 42,900. Now I'm going to do the 42 or 40, I'm sorry, that was at 42, so 42. Let me fill in the rest of this stem and leaf plot. Okay, I put all of our data values on our stem and leaf plot. So we can see clearly that the 46,000 has the most data values in that class or that category. Whereas 41,000 has the least because it doesn't have any in there. But all of our data values here, like this 46,100, is represented on my data, on my stem and leaf plot, 46,100. Notice again, the columns line up so that we can tell that these are all the same. I have two values there. Our columns line up. And then um, we have them from least to greatest. Also, um, let's count to see, make sure I have all the data values on there. We can count our leaves to see how many salaries there were. So there was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30 data values. And sure enough, we had a, a five by six, so there are 30 data values here. One other really important thing on a stem and leaf plot is there must be a key. So this one here, how do we know that that's 46,100? My reader's not going to know that. How do they know? How, do my, how does my reader know that this is 17 and not 1,700? So every steam and leaf plot must have a key to show what those values are. So like in this case, I'm just going to add a key somewhere around my stem and leaf plot that just says that this stem of pick a number two and a line with a leaf of uh, a leaf of say five and that's equal to 25 so that's my key it shows that two five is equal to 25 whereas over here i need a key as well somewhere i need i didn't give myself enough room here but i'm going to make myself a key so that my reader knows that just pick any old value it can be any one off of there so say 48 two that what that's equal to is 48,200. So that key is super, super important on a stem and leaf plot so that your reader knows that this is not just 482, but it's 48,200. 
Then with all of our displays, there needs to be a title. So in this case, it's the salaries, starting salaries. So that needs, you know, I need to have a title to let my reader know what my data shows. And over here, my data is that ACT T scores. So uh, the great thing about a stem and leaf plot is I can actually still see my data values. That's what's so great about it is it, I don't lose my data values. And yet I can see real clearly that this category or class has the most and that one has the least and how spread my data is. I can look at that spread and see that it's pretty evenly spread amongst there. I can also see how many categories I have or classes. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 different classes in that stem and leaf plot. So stem and leaf plots are a great display for maintaining your data values when you have quantitative data. Math made simple is some math. Thanks for watching.